online suya? Sí, ¿no? Sí, sí. Okay, so let's continue. Good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> so we stopped uh, before lunch uh, by just writing uh, this full uh, master equation containing the Hamiltonian in the driven uh, scenario plus the dissipation. Now we move uh, quickly to section three, which is to describe the usual and important regime of linearized optomechanics. And then we will discuss uh, the application of, of cooling. Good. So linearized optomechanics. Okay. So technically what we do first is to make a transformation of that uh, dynamical master equation, which consists in defining a state a rho by, a, so basically change the state rho in the following way. We just apply a time dependent unitary, u, to the state rho. <coughs> and this unitary is nothing else but, but this term, OK? e to the i omega l a dagger a t. This is kind of the energy, it's like the Hamiltonian, it's the time evolution due to the Hamiltonian of the cavity mode, but not at the cavity frequency, but at the laser frequency. That's just a transformation we do. We will describe all the physics in this uh, frame, and this is what in, in quantum optics, sometimes we call like uh, in the rotating frame, okay? These uh, historical names, but for us just means we apply this unitary. And then what you can check is that the time evolution of the rho tilde now is given by the following master equation. You could put this unitary there in that master equation and see how you rewrite things. And without doing any approximation, you arrive, you arrive to this master equation. A Hamiltonian part with a modified Hamiltonian plus the dissipative terms and importantly, one can check the dissipative terms remain the same, okay? Same as before. So you just replace rho by rho tilde, but nothing else. Whereas the Hamiltonian, you need to replace it. And the Hamiltonian replaced is basically given by this form. U h u daga minus this term, okay? This is just comes, there is no, this is a consequence. So if you apply this unitary, you, you apply rho dot here, you, you, you use the product rule, you have three terms, and the one with rho dot, you substitute the master equation, then you rearrange things, and you can always write it like that. The dissipative term will be the same, the Hamiltonian is modified. And actually, how it is modified is, is, is as follows. So basically, this Hamiltonian is nothing else but can be written now like that. Okay, the Hamiltonian can be written like that if you apply this transformation. So the only difference is two things. First, the, the frequency of the, of the cavity mode, in, before it was h omega c, now is minus h delta zero, where delta zero I defined as the detuning. And I decided to define it like that, omega l minus omega c. This is the so-called detuning. Okay, and this terms comes from, from this, because if you, if you check this, uh, what, what this is, this gives you a term of the type uh, omega L A dagger A, as you can check immediately from the definition of, of U. 
And then the other important, uh, important, uh, the other important uh, difference is that now you see the time dependence here that we had in the laser has gone away. And the reason is because uh, the unitary is such that now UA Uraga has this form. Hmm? Good. Anyway, but this is now not important. So it just goes away. So basically, in this rotating frame, now the Hamiltonian becomes time independent. And this is always something uh, you always want. In quantum optics and in quantum physics in general, you want to avoid using uh, time dependent quantum Hamiltonians. As soon as you have some time dependence in the Hamiltonian, you have to think how to make some transformations so that this time dependence goes away. Okay, this simplifies everything a lot. So this is achieved by applying this unitary, which we call going to the rotating frame. And note that the detuning, we decided to define it like that. You could also define it the other way around, and then there would be a plus here, so it doesn't matter. But I decided, uh, we decided like that. And then in optomechanics, we uh, then use the same, uh, so we use the following vocabulary. We call, we talk about red detuning or blue detuning. <clears throat> and what this means is, independent of the, how you define the tuning physically, red detuning, we mean that the laser has a frequency or the driving frequency is lower than the cavity frequency. Namely, it is reddish. It is more red than the frequency of the cavity. Okay? And blue detune means the driving frequency is higher than the frequency of the resonator. It's bluish. Okay. In our de definition, red detuning means laser is lower than omega c. So it's for in our definition that will mean negative detunings, and for blue detuning for us means positive detunings. And that's something you can always choose. Okay. <coughs> and of course, you could also choose I drive in resonance, so omega l equal to omega c, which means the tuning equal to zero. Okay. But so far, no approximation. <coughs> Good. Now, <clears throat> and as I said before, the dissipative terms are just the same. So now what uh, we know is that physically this term, you see this term is kind of driving the cavity. So it will put photons into the cavity. Of course, these photons decay through the, dissipation, uh, through the dissipator to the environment. So on, uh, but if you drive sufficiently enough, it might be that the steady state is such that you have a, a, a steady state of a steady number of photons in the cavity. And since there is also photons in the cavity, these photons also displace the mechanical motion to an, another position. Okay? And we would like to somehow account for that. And actually, a trick that we do, uh, sorry, before, before that, sorry, before that. <coughs> before, sorry, before that. One thing, so from this dynamics, from this simultaneous and this dissipator, one can show what is uh, that the following equations hold for the mean value of A, okay, which you would calculate by the trace of A times rho dot and substitute rho, rho dot by this. Okay? And the equations of motion for this are the following. This will be the equation of motion for A. That's a consequence of this master equation. And the equation of motion for B is this one. OK? And these are the equations of motion for a dry, driven optomechanical system uh, in the rotating frame for the mean values of A. And now precisely, you see that the presence of the driving now, this is a constant, is a source in the mean value in, the, in, in, in this equation. So this will for sure populate A, okay? Good. So now what we do, <clears throat> the next step 
is to make a change of variables. And the change of variables is the following. You call the operator A. Now you call A, a tilde times some complex number times the identity. You just decide to make this change of variables. I change operators in this way. And the B, I also do the same. B tilde plus beta times the identity. And alpha, beta are, in principle, com complex numbers. Okay. And the motivation is that, or what we will then use, is that, as you will see in a second, the, mean, the, mean, uh, the absolute value of this alpha and beta will be, this will be numbers much larger than 1. Okay? We'll be, in, we'll be in scenarios where the absolute value of alpha and absolute value of beta will be larger than 1. And how do we, how do we choose these two numbers? So what we do now is the following. <coughs> So if you would now plug this change of variables here, okay, you will see what will happen. There will be uh, the following. They, they, so you will get these equations now for uh, for more for these new variables, and in particular, I will take from all the num all the terms I get here. I will focus on the terms that only contain alphas and betas, without any mean value of a, mean value of b tilde, okay? So I focus on the following. So from here, I will choose, or well, any of you want, I, I just say that. So I will choose alpha and beta such that they fulfill the following two equations. That zero is equal to And the same for yeah. yeah. I, so I can phrase it here like I'm saying I, I changed the the, the operator. I just def write this operator like that. I can always do that. No, not yet. Not, I have not done any approximation yet. This is just a change of variables. I'm, I can do that. Then we will use this change of variables to make an approximation, which will be the linearization. But at this point, I still, I've still not done anything, any approximation. I'm just making a change of variables, and I can always do that. No, not yet, not yet, not yet. Now I've defined a change of variables, and I choose alpha and beta such that they fulfill these equations, because I won. That's my decision, OK? The motivation a bit is that uh, once we plug this change of variables here, you know, by forcing alpha and beta to fulfill that, a lot of terms will be 0. And that's convenient, OK? And I, but now. Just stay with me. I just choose alpha and beta such that these equations are fulfilled. Good. <clears throat> so then what happens, you can already see, is uh, if you now try to solve this linear, also this system of equations, you see you could uh, basically from here isolate, isolate beta from the second equation as a function of alpha squared plug it here, and then you have an equation of third order, a cubic equation in alpha, OK? An equation, a cubic, uh, an equation which is cubic can, in principle, have, uh, uh, of course, three solutions, OK? And, and actually, this is very interesting in optomechanics. The regime in which you have three solutions is a very well-known regime in optomechanics, which you try to avoid, because the system is what is called bi-stable. So if you drive in some parameter regimes, such that these equations have three solutions, then the system becomes be stable, meaning that because you put uh, light into the, uh, uh, into the cavity, and then there are two stable positions for the mechanical mode. Okay? And we will always try to avoid that regime. And one can show, you could look now at the properties of this equation, that the system has a single solution, and hence the system is stable. 
system has one solution. If the detuning <coughs> is uh, larger than minus square root of 3 over 4 times kappa. Okay, just believe me that. So if the detuning is larger than minus the square root of 3 over 4 kappa, then there is only one solution. Okay? Then there is one solution for alpha, one solution for beta. So we will focus in that regime. We will focus always in the system, uh, one solution that becomes the system is stable in that regime. If you are not fulfilling that condition, then the system becomes be stable, and this was predicted a long time ago and observed experimentally. We are interested in that regime. Okay. Note also that in that stable regime, an approximated solution for alpha <coughs> is this one. This is an approximated, so you can calculate the exact solution, but it doesn't have a very nice closed formula. But if, if G0 is very small, alpha is very well approximated by that, which basically is the solution by, uh, obtained by neglecting this term here and just solving for alpha. Okay, that's a very good approximation to what alpha is. <coughs> which then implies that the mean value of alpha square is approximated to, to this okay. And then from this expression you already see, we will be interested in driving strength. Recall that omega depends on your power. In driving strength, so strong that this and, and sufficiently on resonance, such that this divided by this is way larger than one. And actually in experiments, that's huge. That's sometimes 10 to the eight in most of the experiment, okay? So we will be interested in regimes where this is very large, okay? For instance, sometimes in experiments is even 10 to the eight. Okay, so it's a huge number. Hence, you see that if this is so huge, the mean value of a dagger a, if we substitute our change of variables, it will have this contribution, alpha square, plus uh, the other terms, kind of um, alpha star a plus alpha a dagger, so tilde, sorry, plus, okay. So, and since this is 10 to the eight, these terms here will be at max 10 to the four, and this is of the order of one, so this dominates. So this means the number of photons in the cavity, uh, if this driving is such that this ratio is of the order of 10, means there are kind of 10 to the eight photons into the cavity. So it's highly populated with a lot of electromagnetic field intensi intensity. Okay, so in this regime, this can be neglected. Okay, good. <coughs> So, and then once you have alpha, then you can also calculate beta. And beta then will also be the shift in the equilibrium position. In the sense that now the mean value of x basically is beta plus beta star. So the mean value of x now is not zero, but zzz, the, the oscillator has moved, okay? So that's the idea. So it was, you had first your nice cavity, which was in the vacuum, okay? And then you shine light. Okay, and then you shine light and you populate a lot the cavity and the mirror moves. Okay? And that's the setting we are interested in now, strong driving. And we put a lot of photons. So here, we are in that scenario now. Okay? And how much alpha and beta is? It, it's obtained by analytically solving or numerically solving this equation and just getting the exact expression for that. Okay? And so far, no approximation. I just say, okay, that's what alpha and beta is. Now it will come the approximation, which is 
the so famous linearization. Because now, what I can show, I, I, what I can do is now I plug this change of variables here. Then alpha and beta are decided, are defined such that all these constant terms can, cancel. But then we'll, I will have two types of terms. Terms that only contain A tildes, A tildes, and terms that contains products of A tildes times alpha. Okay? Then, since alpha is so huge, all the terms that contain an alpha dominate versus the terms that do not contain an alpha. So then I throw away the terms that do not contain the alphas. And then this is the so-called linearization approximation. Okay? So, <coughs> the idea, I, I write it. So if I substitute my change of variables, then I would get all these terms. approximations. I put all the terms. Okay, I just put the change of variables and of course I use that alpha and beta are defined such that these terms cancel so that why all these terms are not there anymore because that's my definition of the change of variable. So I contain all these terms and then for the beta I also have Now here it comes the famous linearization approximation. What I do is you see if I compare this term with this term, this term, or, or, or if I compare, this has an alpha, this one has a beta, and this one has nothing. Okay, so this will be super small for alpha and, and beta large. So what I do is I just throw away this term. I, I make this approximation, that's an approximation. And the same here, I, this term I also neglect that term. Then from the structures of the equation, you see this term, I delta 0, I j 0, is, is of the same form. So I will define a new delta, which is delta 0 plus the term here. <coughs> yeah, exactly. And I here have j 0 times alpha. And, and also here, j 0 times, okay. I will define. So what I do is I now rewrite these approximated equations in the following way. So we do two things. We drop tildes, and we get A Two things have happened, and yeah, this will be the new equations of motion, or well, the new equations. And what I've done is I've defined delta without the subindex zero as delta zero plus j zero beta plus beta star. Okay, basically that's the detuning now that the cavity has once the mechanical oscillator has displaced has been displaced to the new equilibrium position. And I have defined J without the subindex zero, very importantly, as this, as the J zero times the modulus of alpha. And I said before that modulus of alpha can be of 10 to the four. So in that way, I increase the coupling by four orders of magnitude. And recall that I said in the beginning of this lecture that G naught was very small. Now with this trick, 
I increase the coupling by many orders of magnitude between the motion and the light. <coughs> and uh, just uh, what I've done a trick is uh, if alpha is not real, which is not real in general, I take the modulus and the phase, and then I can always absorb this phase into and the operators, the operator A, okay? This is just a minor detail. I can really find the A that absorbs this phase, and, and for all practical purposes, assume alpha is real, but anyway, this is just, okay? So that's what I, I have done. Okay, so here it comes, these are the linearized equations, and they are linear because now A only depends on B, whereas before, A was depending on the product of B times A. Okay, this is a nonlinear equation, this is a linear equation for the mean values. And this, this is the famous linearization in optomechanics. Now what I realize is that actually these equations of motion for the mean values I could obtain from the following Hamiltonian. So these equations of motion I can derive from the following effective, effective master equation, effective Hamiltonian. Okay, these, these equations of motion can be obtained from this Hamiltonian. Or from, if you want, from this. Uh, from this master equation, where the dissipator are the same. When you linearize, the dissipators remain the same. Okay, same as before. Same as before. And the Hamiltonian is this one. And please note the differences. In this Hamiltonian, first, there is no delta sub zero. It is delta, it's a new detuning. There is no G naught but G, which is way larger because you have a, a, a modulus of alpha. There is no, this is a linear Hamiltonian now. There are only ter terms containing two creation or, uh, or annihilation operators. Okay, this is now A plus A dagger times B plus B dagger, not A dagger A times B plus B dagger. And the driving is out. Okay? So then in optomechanics, if you search for optomechanics and you look at equation one, uh, depending on the paper, equation one is this one or the other one. And, and uh, this, uh, this Hamiltonian here is the so called single photon uh, or single photon optomechanical Hamiltonian, including driving. This one is the linearized Hamiltonian. Okay, and, and note what we have done. We have gone to a rotating frame first. We have gone to a displaced frame. So we change variables such that we are in this displaced frame, alpha, beta. Then we make an approximation, which is to remove all the nonlinear terms. And we arrive to the Hamiltonian and master equation. <coughs> okay. And basically, this requires that this absolute value of alpha and absolute value of beta should be larger than one for the linearization to be okay. Okay, so this is only valid for very strong driving. Okay, so if the detuning would be very large, this driving would be, this alpha would decrease and might not be rel uh, valid anymore and so on. So one should keep this in mind. The cool thing is that now this system, as it is written like that, this system can be solved exactly analytically. In quantum optics, that's a very easy uh, master equation. Why? For two reasons. This recall. So this is what is called a quadratic system because now the Hamiltonian is quadratic. It only contains creation and uh, products of up to two creation and relation operators, and the dissipative terms com com contain jam operators. Contain uh, jam operators are the operators in front of rho. In the, it's not written here, in the front here, and these jam operators are linear in A and A dagger. When in the dissipator you have linear terms, and in the Hamiltonian up to quadratic, the whole system is what is called quadratic and can be solved analytically or exactly. What do I mean by that? The following.
So now <coughs> you could do the following. So if you define, now define two vectors. Define the vector uh, B sub S as the vector obtained by the mean value of A, the mean value of B, the mean value of A dagger, and the mean value of, of B dagger. Okay, I define this vector. This could be complex numbers. It's a vector of dimension four of complex number, and also define this other vector, VQ, which have more terms. It has A square, uh, B square, AB, so basically all the possible products of two annihilation operations. A dagger B, A dagger square, B dagger square, A dagger B dagger. We should not miss anyone. A B dagger, A dagger A, and B dagger B. Okay. This vector, which contains uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Mention 10. So these are all basically all the first moments and all the second moments. Now, because the system is quadratic, if you now calculate the equations of motion for these mean values, you obtain the following. You obtain that actually the time derivative of these components can be obtained as a matrix MS times this vector BS. So basically, the first moments are closed, so the differential equation for these four moments only depend on their first moments. We, saw, we see actually this first equation is this one. You see the, the time derivative of the mean value of A, time derivative of the mean value of B, only depends on the mean value of A and B, and B is B dagas, and so on, but only on the first moments. Okay. So, and the equation of motion for the quadratic so the quadratic terms also is closed. And it has always this form. Okay, it will have a matrix times the same vector of the variables plus another vector with, con with terms. But the important thing is that the system is closed. Okay, if the system would not be quadratic, when you calculate the time derivative of a term of second order, you would get terms of three order of order three, and then you should take the derivative of the term of th of order three, and you would get terms of order four, and so on. And the system would never close, okay? And that's why you cannot solve exactly. Whereas when the Hamiltonian is quadratic and the dissipator is linear, this equ this uh, uh, differential equations closed, close. And if they close, you can solve them, okay? And this is actually super nice. And uh, because actually this linearized optomechanics still contains a lot of physics, such as cooling and everything. Okay. So, for instance, no? now once you have these differential equations, I recall you that now the time evolution of the first order moments can be calculated by just doing this. Where, uh, and I will define, and the terms for BQ as a function of time. Where, uh, where these are the columns, the co so these lambda matrices, the columns are the eigenvectors, are eigenvectors of the matrix MS or the matrix MQ, and the D is a diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues.
And here in this notation, the BSS is defined as basically the steady state of the quadratic, okay? This is all definitions, just for you to know that the only exercise you need to do is carefully obtain these matrices M, M, Q, and A, which you can do if you do this uh, calculation by the master equation a bit slowly on, on, on a paper with pencil, then you will get these matrices. This matrix is uh, four times four, this one is 10 times 10, but then you could put it on Mathematica, have a little code where given the param physical parameters, broom, you just solve, find eigenvectors, eigenvalues of this matrix, and construct the solution as a function of time. Okay, and here there are very interesting, note that some components of this vector are, for instance, how many phonons do I have as a function of time, how many photons do I have as a function of time, and I could plot the dynamics of the system for any value of the parameters, damping, uh, everything in there, okay? So I really encourage you to, if you are interested, to actually do this exercise. A, and to have this code for you, you will be able to understand and learn a lot of physics because at the end, even though we are talking about optomechanics, these are just the dynamics of two coupled harmonic oscillators with dissipation. And in many situations in physics, you end up having that setting of two harmonic oscillators coupled with dissipation. Okay, so there are already a lot of nice physics that you can do that. First of all, recall that for the system to be stable so that these solutions do not exploit as a function of time, you already see you want that these eigenvalues should have a real part that is uh, uh, negative. If the real part of the eigenvalues are positive, once you evolve as a function of time, this thing could explode, and it does happen. The system can become unstable, meaning that uh, the system would just grow. And of course, physically, this means that you, at some point you will not be linear anymore. You will explore nonlinearities and so on. But the system can become unstable. So you have to make sure if you make such a program uh, to check always that the system uh, is stable, which basically means that the real part of these eigenvalues are uh, smaller than zero, okay? Good. So that's it, so this master equation contains all, a lot of interesting physics. The physics you can analyze actually exactly without further approximation by just doing this exercise. And uh, in the last 10, 15 minutes, I will show you, I have a little program where we do that and we can immediately show some examples. But before that, let me discuss two things. <clears throat> okay, so first of all, uh, One thing, uh, regarding the coherent dynamics in optomechanics, there are two regimes, either in which you are red detuned, meaning you send photons that have energy smaller than the cavity, which that means the detuning So there is the red detune scenario, which means delta is of the order of minus omega m. So basically you shine photons that have a frequency smaller than the cavity frequency and the, and the difference is comparable to the mechanical frequency, which was megahertz. When this happens, then one obtains the so-called beam splitter type of interaction. Okay. Which and in that setting, you can do what is called the rotating wave approximation, which then allows me to describe the effective dynamics. You can see that the dynamics basically are very well described by this Hamiltonian. So the same as before by dropping two terms. Okay, you see in the interaction I have four terms. 
Okay? But if the detuning is basically very similar to minus omega m, these two oscillators have the same frequency. And if they have the same frequency, you see that here there are terms that would kind of not conserve energy. These would be terms that they generate one excitation in the phonon and one in the photon. And if these two modes have the same frequency, this doesn't conserve energy. So to first order, you can throw this away. Okay, and then you only keep the terms that conserve energy. But this, the rotating wave approximation, is only valid if the coupling is sufficiently small. Okay, valid if coupling is much smaller than omega m. If the coupling starts to be comparable to omega m, the rotating wave approximation is not valid. Okay, and what this term does, this beam splitter, this is just a, is a term that exchange energy between one mode and the other. Okay, and let me show you that. Let's see if this works. Okay, so this is a, li a little code uh, that basically does this, okay? It just solves these equations for the given parameters. So what I do now is I put the two, so here uh, I put the two, this should be the, 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 the two frequencies, okay? I put them equal, okay? So one I call omega, uh, omega cavity, but would be minus uh, the detuning, okay? And I put these two equal. Then I put some coupling J0, and I put a, a very small dissipation. And initially, I just put uh, 10 to the uh, 1,000 excitations into the mechanical mode, and zero excitations of the cavity mode. Then if I put, I, I, I calculate the time evolution of the number of excitations in each mode, you just see some super uh, nice and stable oscillations. And this is calculated using the rotating wave approximation and without the rotating wave approximation. Then you see I start with 1,000 excitations in the mechanical mode, and, and then after a G time, I just exchange energy from one to the other, okay? Now, for instance, you could say, and this is for a very low dissipation. If now you increase a bit kappa, okay, which is the decay of the photons, then you would see that these oscillations are just damped, okay? You exchange energy between the two, but the photons, you know, you put the 1,000 phonons, you put them into photons, but the photons can start to decay, or disappear from the cavity. So all this energy is being lost through the cavity, okay? And if you would increase even more, okay, uh, yeah, then, you know, you're just damped very fast. Okay. So if instead, you keep the cavity very uh, clean, but you put dissipation on the mechanical motion, then uh, what you get is you also, the oscillations get damped, but now the energy is not lost because recall that the mechanical, uh, the bath of the mechanical bath has some temperature, so you can put energy from the bath into the system. So that's why it doesn't go to zero, it goes to the steady state, which I chose a number such that is the same as the initial. So if I increase the damping a lot, Uh, you know, it just goes to the steady state, okay? So both the photon and the cavity goes to the same number of excitations as the bath, okay? And you see in all these cases, both the rotating wave approximation and, the, and is valid. So if I put again low dissipation in both, okay? And now what I do is I increase a bit the coupling. Now the coupling was, the frequency was one and the coupling was 0 0.1. So the coupling was 10% uh, of the frequency. If I increase the coupling, for instance, to, yeah, sorry, to 30%, uh, you see it still looks again, but you see the oscillations start to look a bit different. They, don't, they are not perfectly. This is, this is when the rotating wave approximation starts to fail. This is the real stuff. This one is not completely correct. And if you increase a bit more, this is very sensitive, actually. If you put already 40%, you see it's completely different. So then the rotating wave approximation starts to fail. It's not correct to neglect this seemingly non-conserving energy terms because the coupling is so large that even these modes are not well defined without the coupling. And actually, there is a, if you put really close to, to half the frequency, the system gets very, very different. And actually, if you would put five, this is a, a well-known uh, instability. Then the system is unstable. So actually, you start to put a lot of energy to the system. So it, get, it gets crazy, okay? So this is just for the, for the beam splitter type of interactions.
let's go back to the small coupling. Okay. Good. So that's for uh, when the uh, when you are read the tune, where you send photons that have uh, frequencies smaller than the cavity frequency. The other regime that I just briefly mentioned is what happens if you are blue the tune. <coughs> You are blue detuned. If you are blue detuned, which means uh, delta is comparable to omega m, but positive, so you send photons that have an energy higher than the cavity photons, then the Hamiltonian in the rotating wave approximation, it contains the other two terms. Okay, and this term, this type of interaction is called a two-mode squeezing interaction because what it does, it, it, the system is unstable. You keep putting energy into the system, but in a way that you create what is called a two-mode squeeze state between the mechanical mode and the light, which basically it generates a highly entangled, a highly entangled state between the motion and the mechanics, okay? So this is also a very interesting regime. But now what I want to do for this last, I will ask you more 10 extra minutes to discuss a bit more of ground state cooling, OK? Yeah, the, the sign of G is not important. No, it doesn't change the physics. So I kept track to as it is defined. No, but it. Huh? Sorry? If G is negative, maybe. No, no, no. Uh, as far as I know, because everything will go with G squared, and the sign here is not so important. No. Okay, so now the last thing I want to discuss also qualitatively and with the, with the simulation is the, the round state cooling, but basically we have all the ingredients. <coughs> Okay, so how, how the situation is, um, is the following. So we have this mechanical mode of frequency omega m. The, we have this mechanical mode optical, which in the rotating frame has a frequency of minus delta, but recall that originally has a frequency omega c. And now in the driven regime, they are linearly coupled by g. Then omega m is coupled to a bath of temperature T and the cavity mode also to a bath of the same temperature, okay? Uh, and the couplings are, are the following. So the energy, so the mechanical mode loses energy into the bath with a rate gamma times N bar omega M plus one. And, this, and it gains energy with a rate gamma N bar times of omega M. And the key is that the optical mode only loses energy through a rate kappa. And actually, this is, uh, in this setting, this is actually very interesting, no? So we have, the, the, the bath of the two systems is the same. It has the same temperature. So, what, and of course, cooling means that you are flowing energy from this mechanical mode to here. So how come this happens if this temperature is the same, okay? The reason is that the temperature is the same, but the entropy of the mode is very different because Recall that because of this, you see here, here there is only one arrow, so there is a net flow of energy going here, and fundamentally that happens because since the cavity mode has a frequency way larger than the mechanical mode, 
for the same temperature, the, mean, the thermal mean number occupation at the at the cavity mo, at the cavity frequency is way lower, uh, smaller than 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 this one. Okay. <coughs> so basically, the cavity mode has lower entropy. Okay, degree of basically is in the ground state, is in the vacuum, and this in the rate equations. This means you see there is no energy coming up from here, so there is if the couplings are correct and the, the parameters are correct, there is a net flow of energy going to the right. Okay, note also that these two modes originally they have very different frequency, omega m and omega c. Omega m is ten to the six, cavity frequency could be ten to the fifteen. And if they have to talk to each other. And two oscillators, if they have very, very different frequency, they don't talk to each other. But now by the driving, we adjust this frequency such that this detuning now in the rotating frame has a similar frequency of omega m. That's why they talk. Okay? That's just from the dynamical equations. So what is the mechanism of cooling? Let's first also, I mean, this is a bit from the equations, but let me also give you a bit of intuition of what is going on. Okay, so the idea is you send photons, and these photons for cooling should be red detuned, should have a frequency smaller than omega c. Then, by being smaller than omega c, they can only enter into the cavity by gaining energies from the phonon. Okay, so basically, you send photons that have less energy than the cavity photons, they only enter inside because they absorb one phonon. And once they are inside, they don't go, uh, they don't uh, uh, emit back into the phonon, but at some point they decay to the bath. And then this energy is lost. Okay? And in that way, you can create a process where you are extracting phonons. That's a, a kind of a similar picture of, of this one. And in a more diagrammatic uh, scheme, Of course, one can develop the theory from the master equation, do all of these, and understand this perfectly. All the physics are included in these dynamical equations, so you could just explore yourself once you have the program. But I just tell you how the things work. So if I make this diagram, Okay, so this I define energy levels. The first index is uh, how many photons do I have in the cavity? Zero photons in the cavity, one photon in the cavity. The second one is how many phonons do I have? I have n phonons, n phonons. And here, uh, n plus one phonon, zero photons, okay? So therefore, the energy between these uh, two levels is always the same, is h bar omega c. And the energy between these two levels is h bar omega m, and of course, Omega C is way larger than omega M, so that's correct. Now, the idea is that what we, sh we, we shine a laser that has a frequency omega L, which is lower than omega C. You see, this would be omega C. It's, it's smaller than omega C. And how much smaller? Precisely so small that this difference that is missing is omega M. The, the tuning I said, we tune it such that it's omega M. So what happens by shining this, uh, this, uh, this frequency is that now two things happening. This frequency is resonant to this interaction. So this you enhance that interaction a lot. So this transition amplitude, which is the one in which you uh, annihilate one phonon by putting one photon. Okay? This was this beam splitter interaction. This one is resonant and very strong. 
Whereas to go to the other side, to basically excite the photon and excite the phonon, this is very much of resonance. This is very far the tune. Okay. So then what happens is you start to oscillate like that. And if the cavity is lossy, as soon as you excite the photon, the photon decays. It goes away. Okay? And then you go to here. So you basically do this transition, and then you go down. And then, since the laser is still on, you go to this one, where now you have 1 n minus 2. You, you excite this one, and then you go down again. And in this way, you just pump, you go to the left, and at some point you will hit the 0, 0, which is the ground state. And then you cannot go more to the left. Okay? So this is what is called the sideband cooling. And this is a very, uh, um, this is the sideband cooling. And what it requires, it requires that the mechanical frequency should be larger than kappa, OK? Because in a sense, this makes that these two transitions are very well uh, distinguishable, OK? Because if kappa would be very large, this line width would be so large that there would be no difference to this difference in energy levels, OK? If kappa, the line width of this level, is very large, here and here would look the same. So you would not distinguish these two transitions. OK, so you require this condition, omega m larger than kappa for effective cooling. And also, <coughs> and also for, uh, and this cooling scheme is efficient, efficient for a small coupling. which means that the coupling should be smaller than kappa, okay? which means that you don't want that this thing is oscillating a lot. You want that as soon as it goes up, boom, it decays. Okay? <coughs> and if you fulfill these two conditions, then one can show So basically, if you fulfill this, you can see that the effective cooling rate, how much energy you are removing from the oscillator as a function of time, this effective cooling rate is basically g squared over kappa over 2. This is the rate at which you are flowing energy from here to there. Um, yeah. Okay. This is the cooling rate. So this is the flow of energy from the mechanical mode here. And then to cool, you should make sure that this cooling rate is higher than the heating rate that comes from the bath. So then what you need is cooling rate, cooling rate uh, larger than the heating rate. And the heating rate of the mechanical mode is gamma times m bar. So this basically requires the g squared over kappa over 2 is larger than gamma over 2 n bar, which then this is typically defined as, as like that, as this condition. So you need that the, what is called the cooperativity, g squared divided kappa gamma times 4 is larger than n bar of the, of the mechanical bath. If this is fulfilled, then you will definitely cool. Okay, And I'm just uh, quoting uh, results. You have to believe me on that. Again, everything is encoded in these equations, and you could do some theory to obtain that analytically, all these conditions. But if you fulfill that, then the final occupation number, the final temperature, the final occupation number for the mechanical mode is basically n bar omega m plus c, so divided by c, plus this fundamental limit kappa omega m squared. 
Okay? This is in these assumptions. Then if your cooperativity is large enough such that this ratio is smaller than 1 and omega m is larger than kappa, then this can be smaller than 1. And then we say that we just, by shining a laser, we wait and zzz, the center of mass of this mechanical mode goes to the quantum ground state. And these are experiments that have been done this last years. Okay, I know this is now a lot of conditions, but again, if you build this little program, which is not so hard, you can study this by yourself, and i show you an example. And with that, we will conclude the lecture today. <coughs> All right. So, so this is what I'm doing here. Uh, I put so let's so these are uh, first of all I, here these two numbers means I tune the detuning to be completely red detuned so equal to minus omega m, and then I put a sufficiently small coupling. You see, g is small compared to um, so uh, sorry, and I'm using a kappa of 0 0.1. So you see kappa is smaller than omega m, so I'm fulfilling, uh, I'm fulfilling this condition. I'm also fulfilling this one. Okay. So then if I plot the number of phonons as a function of time, I just get uh, this type. This is phonon in a log scale as a function of time. Then you see I start from, I put initially uh, 10,000 phonons. Okay, and then I just wait, and it's dec decaying exponentially as a function of time, and the dashed line here is, um, you know, just one. So I really go to the ground state. Okay, so if I would not do that correctly, for instance, if my kappa, um, if my yeah, or if I put too much mechanical damping, so for instance. Mechanical damping is 10 to the minus 6. Why is this so? Yeah. Then, for instance, I don't cool exactly to, to 1. I cool a bit too, too high. Okay? This is the blue line. So I don't cool below 1. So, but now, with a bit of care, you can choose parameters such that you end up really cooling to the ground state. Okay? And basically, all these conditions are fulfilled. So, for instance, in that particular case, the, the condition that is not fulfilled is this one. This one is not fulfilled. Hence, I'm limited by that. Okay. Uh, if, for instance, I don't, if my uh, kappa is not so good, so if, for instance, let's let's reduce again the mechanical damping. Okay, this is the situation of before that I was ground state cooling, but now say um, my kappa is not so great, okay? So it's not, it's too large compared to the mechanical frequency. For instance, it's 1.1, okay? <coughs> so it's low, sorry. So I think it's yeah, then you see I'm cooling not so effectively, right? And things like that. And, uh, and as I said before, this is something that Making this little program for you probably is maximum a full day or less. Okay, just to write the equations carefully, check that there are no mistakes, obtain the matrix, and then make a little program that diagonalizes. So given the input parameters, which again, the input parameters are only the two frequencies, G, kappa, gamma, and initial conditions and temperature. You just get numbers into these matrices. You find eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and then you just uh, solve that and plot this as a function of time. That's what I'm doing here, okay? And then you could really explore all these regimes and, and understand and check with the papers that there are some theory papers where they show you how to uh, derive all these limits here, okay? So do you have questions? I rushed a bit at the very end, but, but the main goal of this lecture was that, uh, that you really understand how you derive from the very beginning this final simple linear Hamiltonian plus dissipation from which you can basically uh, study a lot all the physics by, by yourself, exa even uh, exactly without further approximations. Okay.